Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Worship is indeed a privilege. God gives set instructions so that we can approach Him properly. And the more one pours over the Scripture, especially the Scriptures in regard to worship, we will understand better how to draw closer to God, how to be pleasing to Him, how to worship Him as He demands and as his son demanded to be so in spirit and in truth. And for the sake of this message tonight, I want to emphasize that that last phrase, in truth, so important. You cannot worship God if you are denying, suppressing, or ignoring the truth. Now, we have seen over the last several months great instruction in the book of Exodus concerning worship. And we need to realize something. There is no coincidence in the Word of God. Everything that God does, everything that God reveals, there is a purpose for it. And therefore, we need to remember, and we've talked about this, that in the book of Exodus, also known as the book of redemption, it's so significant that not only does God tell the Passover story, but he also gives several chapters about how to worship him. And in many ways, we are approaching now the final chapters and the climax in regard to tabernacle worship. Now, the word tabernacle, mishkan in Hebrew, comes from a Hebrew verb which means to dwell. And here's the relationship. It is when God dwells with us that we are able to worship, to worship Him as He instructed. So this tabernacle is all about bringing Shekinat Hashem, the glorious dwelling presence of God, into the midst of the people. And for that to happen, all, and I want to emphasize this, all His instructions must be observed. If anything is ignored, if anything is not dealt with in a proper way through fidelity, the exact instructions, then it's going to hinder. It is going to create a situation that God does not find pleasing, that is not going to be conducive for His presence to be with the people. And that's why these things are so important. And as we have gone through the various chapters in regard to tabernacle worship, we've seen, we've encountered principles that we need to apply to our life today in order that we worship God, as I said, in truth. So let's begin chapter 36, the book of Exodus. We did the first half of this chapter last week when we focused in on the the curtains that were made, the tent for over the tabernacle. And now we're going to focus in on how the tabernacle was erected, those various elements in order that it could stand in place. So look with me, Exodus 36, beginning with verse 20. Here we're dealing with not the curtains, but rather there is an emphasis upon upon the the structure. Those things, and here's the key, those things that support all the elements, the main elements in the tabernacle construction. Verse 20. Vayas. And he made. Now, we saw earlier on when we encountered this tabernacle and much of the same material, 
as now it's a repetition, we saw that it was always in the third person. Most of the time, and most scholars see this relating to Moses, that he was responsible. God gave him the instructions, and he was supposed to carry it out. Obviously, we've seen there was others like Bethsael and Ohaliav, and many others who were given wisdom in order to do the work. But ultimately, it was Moses who was given the responsibility to make sure that the tabernacle work was done in order that the tabernacle could be set up and the people could begin a new way of worshiping God. And I want to emphasize this, this new way of worshiping God because we see a progression, we see an order. And this order now is a tabernacle worship whereby the people dwell around the presence of God. And that is important in understanding what worship is, us dwelling with, around the presence of God, coming to Him. Now, even though the Shkinat Hashem, the dwelling presence of God, and there are some that say the word Lishkon from tabernacle, Mishkan, and Shkina, the dwelling presence, there's a unique aspect of why this word is used rather than simply another word, like the word leshevet or the word lagur. Both of those means to reside, to dwell, to, to stay in a location. But the word lishkon, what many of the rabbinical authorities will tell you, there's a very important passage in the book of Genesis, Genesis 26, where, where Yitzchak, because of a famine in the land, he was going to leave the land. And God told him, Yitzchak, you dwell in the land. In the next verse, we have that word gur to lagur to dwell. But here it's a different word, lishkon, the same word where we get the Hebrew word mishkan. And here's the unique thing. The, the authorities tell us that the word lishkon means to dwell, to reside, to, to live in a location, but to do so in a way that God's glory is manifested. Many of you know the term, it's kind of, I've been using the word shkina. In, in English, they take that word and kind of put the, the emphasis on a different syllable, and they get the word shekinah. And Shekinah, many of you know that this deals with the glory of God, God's glorious dwelling presence. It's the same word, Hebrew, Shekinah. English, we say Shekinah. So the idea here is that this is all for the purpose of revealing God's glory. That's what my life should be about, emphasizing and, and elevating, revealing, being an instrument of God's glory. Verse 20, and he made the, and these would be the boards or the planks for the tabernacle, the mishkan. And they were made, of course, as it says, from acacia work, acacia wood, and they were standing, omdin, standing up. And the emphasis of this last word in the Hebrew text, omdin, is to tell us how the mishkan, the tabernacle, it was primarily fabric, skins of animal, how it would stand upright. And this is through these, these planks, these boards, and the construction of these planks as they were placed in the ground, as they were attached with the curtain so that the tabernacle could function. So he made the planks for the tabernacle it was made these planks were made of acacia wood standing verse 21 we're going to find concerning these planks the length and the width of them we read in verse 2 10 cubits length of the plank and a cubit and a hetzi cubic that's a half cubit was the width so the length of it, 
and we've talked about the fact that a cubic is primarily from this part of the arm to the end of the fingertips. There was 10 cubics for each plank, its length as it stood up. And the width was a cubic and a half. Each plank, if you look carefully, it tells us here that the plank was, was just that each one, all the ones that were made. Verse 22. Now, we have to stand them up so there was what we could call here, and I believe the best way to understand this is kind of a, a joint. At the bottom of the, the board, there was a joint, and not just one. We're going to see two joints. And these two joints were fit into what's known as a socket in order that it would hold these boards in place and the weight that was upon them of these curtains. And these curtains were all so thick, as we know, that they were made of four different materials. So, verse 22, two joints for one plank. And then we have the phrase for, for interlocking. Now, earlier, when we talked about joining one curtain to the next, we used the word lechaber. There was a chibor, a joining together. But, but this is different. It's not just joining them side by side, but it's an interlocking. And therefore, we have a different word that is used here. Interlocking them one to one. Thus, he made... This for every plank of the tabernacle. So each plank was the same, the same length, the same measurement. Each had two joints. And we're going to see, look at verse 23. And he made the planks for the tabernacle. And how many were there in total? Well, we're going to deal with three different sides. The first side is going to be the side that is on the south. And there's going to be, look at verse 23 again, he made the planks for the tabernacle, and we're told how many? 20. 20 planks for the southern side. Then we're going to get a greater piece of information. I mentioned to you that there was these sockets that the, the joints were placed in. Two joints for each plank, so there would have to be two sockets as well. So if we have 20, 20 planks, 20 boards, then there's going to have to be 40 sockets, and that's what we're told in verse 24. And 40 sockets of silver he made underneath the 20 planks. Two sockets underneath one board and two joints and two sockets underneath one board. So there's two joints and each joint, we're told, has a socket that it goes into. And it's a socket that holds the joint that supports the plank in order that the, the curtains of the tabernacle can be attached to it. And we know we've studied before how that was done. Look now to, to verse 24 again. Forty sockets of silver he made underneath the twenty boards, two sockets under one board, and two joints and two sockets for one board, for the two joints. So it's very clear on how they were assembled. Look now to verse 25. Verse 25 is going to deal with an additional side. It says, the side, the second side of the tabernacle, and this would be the north. So we've dealt with the southern side. In its construction, now we're going to deal with the northern side in its construction. We'll find that they are similar. Verse 25. 
the second side of the tabernacle on the north he made 20 boards these 20 plaques so the same number of plaques both on the the southern side and the northern side which we're talking about now and also verse 26 40 sockets of silver two sockets underneath one plank two sockets underneath one board so again nothing's being said different here but we have once more this emphasis he wants to tell us there's two sockets underneath one board and each board has two joints that obviously in the same way that we've learned goes into these sockets in order that they could be maintained that they could be held up in the right location verse verse 27 and for the side of the Mishkan, and by the way, here we're using a different word. It's significant that even though that in most English Bibles and what I frequently do, we translate these words, which are synonyms the same way, but there's different words being used for each of the sides. Now we're dealing once more, verse 27, the side of the Mishkan, the tabernacle that was on the Yama on the west. It's different because he says, make six boards. So only six planks. The, the southern 10, excuse me, the southern one, 20. The northern one, 20. But this, this western one, is going to be more narrow only six in total but be careful because there's going to be another set of instructions that's going to change the total of the boards but once more verse 27 on the western side of the tabernacle make six planks these six boards but verse 28 and two boards make four and this is a word for a a corner so if we have this western side there's going to be two corners and these corners are going to be different there's going to be one plank obviously on six you're going to have the first one and the sixth one but on these two extremities He's going to tell us to do something additionally. Verse 28. Two boards make for the corners of the Mishkan in the side. Verse 29. And they shall be, and we have the word here, toamim. Now, toamim is twins. So on these six planks that form the western side, the first plank and the last plank, the sixth one. It is going to be twins, meaning there's going to be an additional plank placed on them that's together with them on the corners so that the two extremities are stronger. They are double. And so if we had six and we add one on one side and one on the other side, how many total are there going to be? Obviously eight. And this is what we're going to be told. But first of all, look again at verse 29. They shall be twins down below, underneath, at the bottom. And they shall be together. And they shall be equal. And this is a word for, for blameless, as it oftentimes appears. But it means that they're going to be the same as well on the top. It's top. And there's going to be, in order to join them, there's going to be a ring, one ring. Thus he made for the two of them at the two extremities, these two sides. So here we're going to find that the two planks are going to be joined together at the bottom, excuse me, at the top with a ring. And this ring is going to hold them into place. What else are we going to find out about it? Well, 
we find that they are going to be similar because if you look, look now to verse 30. And there shall be, like I said, a total six and then an extra plank on each side. So a total, as I mentioned, eight. There shall be eight planks. And also there's going to be these, these sockets of silver. And how many? There's going to be a total of, just like the other two sides, the southern and the north. For every plank, there's two sockets because each plank has those two joints. So the same thing's going to be here. And the important thing to realize is, all together, that, that side on the west is going to have a total, each plank, all eight of them, are going to have two sockets. So two times eight, 16. That's why we read all of verse 30. There shall be eight planks and a silver sockets. How many silver sockets? 16 silver sockets. Two sockets. Two sockets underneath one board. Now, I didn't stutter because it says that literally repeats it twice. It says 16 sockets, two sockets, meaning two sockets for each board, and it says it again. Two sockets underneath one board. Verse 31. Now, each of these curtains that are hung on the planks for the three sides, whether we're speaking about the southern, the northern, or the western, we need to realize something. This is only for the purpose of attaching, attaching the curtains. The curtains are what we studied last week. But we need to join everything together. And how are we going to do that? Well, there's going to be a pole. And this pole is going to be what locks. And the word pole here is different than some of the other places in the scripture that the word pole appears like a moat. But this moat is another Hebrew word for pole. Here, what we're going to find is that there's going to be poles that lock, that, that, that fix these things together, everything together, all three sides, so it's firm. And this is what I want you to understand is in Israel today, the largest company that makes doors, and the doors are secure, they have deadbolts, four deadbolts, and they take the name from the word that appears here. Look, if you would, to verse 31. And make these poles of acacia wood. How many poles are there going to be? There's going to be five poles for the planks of the side of the Mishkan. So let's look again, look again at this, verse 31. And he made poles of acacia wood, five, for the, the planks of one side of the the. Mishkan, the tabernacle, and five bars for, for the planks on the second side. Five bars for the planks of the tabernacle also on the western side. So the first side would be the southern. And all the way, each one of these curtains, these structures coming together, the two, are going to have five bars, two at the top, one in the middle, and two at the bottom, five in total. Now, what we're going to be told, and we learned this a few weeks ago when we studied the same material in an earlier chapter, the middle one is going to go all the way through. The others just connect two of the curtains two of the planks where the curtains are placed upon. But we have, and look at this very carefully, next verse, verse 33. And he made the middle bar for locking in the midst of the, the, the planks from one end to the other. So the middle one, 
goes from the very beginning all the way to the end. The two top and the two bottom did not only the middle one. But nevertheless, it would be extremely secure. And what are we seeing here? Well, the tabernacle, when we look at how it's made, it was made in a most stable way. And when we live in a manner that brings God's presence into our life, it will bring stability, great stability into our life. But when we ignore the instructions of God, when we're casual with his word, and we embrace the ways of the world and adapt them for our worship, it is going to bring about instability. Instability in the congregation, instability in the individual members of the congregation. And we're going to see that there will not be unity. There's a relationship between stability and unity. And because God's word is being set aside, remember how we began our, our, our worship service tonight? Looking at Titus chapter 3 and that verse that says, if there's a heretic, you warn him, you rebuke him once, twice. But after the second rebuke, reject him. Put him out. Because we can't let anything interfere with the stability of, that God wants for his house, for his tabernacle. Look, if you would, to, to verse, verse 34. And the planks, we learn something new. They are to be covered with gold. And the rings also, this would be on the top, they should also be made of gold. Now, these rings are for the, the attaching of these poles because it says they should be for houses, for the poles. So these rings are round and they're what the poles slide into. Both of them are gold. Likewise, you cover the bars also with gold. Now the word also is not there. It simply says, and he covered the bars, their bars, or poles, with gold. Verse 35. Now, in verse 35, we have something unique. We've been talking about the, the sides, the three sides, the southern, the northern, and the western one. And we know that the tabernacle, we find that there's two significant places, a holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place is known as the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. In there, we know that there was the, the Ark of the Covenant, for example. Outside, we find that there were other utensils that we'll talk about once more next week. When we look at chapter 37, but there was a separation between the most holy place and the holy place. There was a veil, for example. Matthew 27 speaks about this veil that it was, was torn when Messiah gave up his spirit on that, that cross on Passover when he died. It says, at that exact time, the veil of the temple that separated the most holy place, the holy of holies, from the holy place was torn from the top to the bottom. And remember, we're going to see, it's thick. Why do I know that? Well, let's just read the scripture. Look with me to verse 35. And he made the parochet. Parochet is that, that veil, that veil of separation between the most holy place, the vir habayit, the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, and the Holy Place. Verse 35. And he made the veil, and he made it of Techelet, that, that unique turquoise, that blue, and Argaman, that royal purple, and also scarlet, Tola'at Shani, and also a twisted linen, a, a fabric. Shesh, shesh, mazar. And this was made in a design. It took, it took wisdom. 
It took thinking to design. Some will say that it was woven, for example. And then we have on that, that parochet, there was also a picture of it says, and make, the, make it with kruvim. So there was two kruvim, these cherubim, on the, the parochet. Now, this is information that Moses is being instructed. But remind, be reminded that there was a, a four-level weaving of both that techelet, the argaman, the tolaat shani, and this, this twisted shesh. All these four things, turquoise, purple, Scarlet and this twisted fabric. All of that made the parochet and it had cherubim placed upon this veil. Verse 36. And he made for it, for the, the parochet. Now how do I know that? Because it says la, which is feminine, for her. And the word parochet is in the feminine. So he made for it four of these uh, planks. But here there's a different word. It's a word for amud, pillars. So we see that the parochet, this veil, was supported not with wooden planks, but with pillars. And these pillars, pay very close attention, they were made of acacia wood. It says in verse 36, and he made for it four pillars of shittim, of acacia wood. And these pillars were also colored with gold. And their hooks, what hooks are we talking about? The hooks that place the veil upon the pillars. It says these hooks were also, also gold. And there was cast, now this would have been melted material. We'll talk about what it is in a second. These were not, remember the, the kruvim. We see that all, like the, the menorah, was beaten into place. They would take a lump of gold or whatever it was, and they would either beat it into place or they would chisel it. But here we have something different. Look again at the text, verse Verse 36 at the end, and they cast it for them, for these pillars, four sockets of silver. So instead of having two sockets like all the planks had, these pillars only had one socket, and they were made of silver. Verse 37. Now we're going to complete the structure because there's going to be a screen. Not necessarily a curtain that we've seen, or a veil, but rather a different word, masach. In modern Hebrew, that word can also be for a television a screen, a computer screen, a monitor, or any type of screen. It says, and he made a masach, a screen, for the entrance of the tent. This would be the tent of meeting. And this, uh, uh, this screen was made also of techelet, turquoise, argaman, purple, tolaat, shani, scarlet, and also shesh, mazar, this twisted linen. He made it, but now we have an additional word. This is a word for a work, and earlier it says, mase choshev, a thinking work, a design work. But this is the word rokem. We've come across it before. It has to do with embroidery. So it is a finer type of, of labor. And it says finally in verse 38, and by the way, this will be our last verse, and its pillars, there were, notice what it says, five. And there were hooks. And these hooks were covered their heads were covered and not only there was a hooks but there was these bands that the hooks were placed upon and we find here that the bands they were gold 
And the sockets, well, the sockets here that we're talking about, they were of copper. So look again at verse 38. And it's pillars. And realize something, when we go back up, we see in verse 36, and make for it four pillars. That's for the parochet, the veil that divided the Holy of Holies from the holy place. But now we're dealing with the screen, the entrance into the, the tabernacle. And it had five pillars. And on the top of these pillars, there were hooks. And it was co covered their heads and their bands that was on top with gold. But the sockets that, that held, that, that supported these pillars, these sockets were made of copper. So God gives very precise illustrations or instructions for how this should be done. And it's only when one really believes that God's words matters that they obey. And that's my final principle that I'd like to leave you with this evening. It is only when someone really believes that God's word matters, it makes a difference. If we embrace it in its entirety, fully obeying, or someone's just casual about it, realize some, something. No one has the right to alter God's word. We need to affirm it, embrace it, and carry it out. And when we do, you will find that you're being brought into intimacy, into God's presence to experience His love and understand greater how marvelous, wonderful, and truly great our God is. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.